Well, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Peter Lill back, back with us again this year, and I introduce him pretty much the same way every year, but for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Lilback, he is the president of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and also professor of historical theology there, uh, and author of numerous articles and books, and probably the best known of his books is George Washington's Sacred Fire, a biography on the first president, and uh, I guess we would call it a spiritual biography on him. Uh, Dr. Lilback will be speaking, by the way, not only this hour, but in the, for the ministry of the word, and he'll be speaking on Isaiah 53 then, but uh, this hour he's speaking on an historical and theological subject, and he is highly qualified to do that. I'm looking forward very much to what Peter has to say, and so Dr. Lilback, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan Duncan, pastor of Believer's Chapel. Today it's my joy to share uh, a story that has relevance to all of us, even if you've never heard of the person I'm speaking about. If you ever have asked the question, is that a conservative or liberal church? You're basically using the language that J. Gresham Machen put into Christian vocabulary. It's a story as to how that came about. Now, on a Sunday, when we are here to honor the living God and the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we might ask the question, why are we wasting time talking about human beings, not the sovereign Lord? Well, the scriptures uh, have a verse that I always like to read when I do a historical lecture in a church setting, because uh, this verse gives me job security as a church historian. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then in the verse you all know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in other words, the scriptures give us the encouragement to remember those who have taught us the word of God, to consider the impact their life has made. And notice it doesn't say imitate them. Because we can't imitate people for a part of history. We have to be uniquely who we are at our moment in time. But it says imitate their faith. The faith that drove them to accomplish the ministry and the impact that they've made, that is what we are to imitate. So with that uh, biblical text, then let's take a look at this PowerPoint that uh, has a lot of uh, data. We can't dwell on it all. I might have a few moments at the end for a question or two. What time do I need to be done, Dan? Um, Quarter after, is that about right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to be talking about this man, J. Gresham Machen. That's the portrait that is often remembered uh, of him. He was a Princetonian professor who launched a biblical movement that impacted America and eventually brought about the Westminster Seminary. For those of you that are uh, closely connected with Dallas Seminary, Machen and uh, Lewis Berry Chafer were in correspondence with each other. Uh, when Dallas started, I guess is its 100th year, uh, Machen was still teaching at Princeton, and a few years later, in uh, 1929, Machen started Westminster. So we're sort of uh, twin brothers in terms of theological institutions. Uh, 2023, last year, was the 100th anniversary of his famous book called Christianity and Liberalism. This is the one that Westminster Seminary recently produced. And uh, if you get World Magazine, you might recognize it as the book of the year for last year, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. A 100-year-old book being republished. It's never gone out of print, but this became the book of the year for World Magazine because the topic that it presents seems to be timelessly important for the church in our era. We read it and you say, wow, was this just written now? Well, no, it was written now over a century ago, but its theme and its issue, now hopefully as we'll see, is extraordinarily relevant for Christian believers in our day. So in this centennial uh, issue, we want to remember then the groundbreaking theology and critique that Machen brought. My slide says we will review the life of Dr. Machen and the fruit of his work. 
Our focus is his thesis and argument from his classic book. It has made a remarkable impact in the century that followed its publication. And I'm grateful to welcome you as we consider Machen's insistence that Christianity and liberal modern theology are not only opposed, but are in fact two different religions. That is his key thesis. And we'll talk more about that. Now to set the stage, we know as uh, theologically trained people at Believer's Chapel, there are certain sets of principles that people often use. We might say the six Protestant principles, the tulip, the five points of Reformed soteriology, the five fundamentals of the faith. These three principles shape much of what we would probably share together in our theology. To review them quickly, Undoubtedly, you could say these in Latin as well as English. Sola Scriptura, Solus Christus, Sola Fide, Sola Gratia, Soli Deo Gloria, and the priesthood of the believer. These Protestant principles are what created the common unity of the various varieties of Protestant thought. Uh, there are different ways that we look at sacraments or church government, but if you're a Protestant, these are the things that unite us. At Believer's Chapel, you'll recognize the five points of Calvinism, as they've been called, or the truths of God's sovereign grace, often uh, remembered by the acrostic of the tulip. This comes from the Synod of Dort uh, later on in the Reformation period in the Netherlands as the debate between Jacob Arminius and the Reformed theology developed. And the canons of the Synod of Dort have been summarized as total depravity unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. These truths unite together folks who call themselves Reformed or Calvinistic in their doctrines of salvation. And of course, I would pause here and say I owe a great debt to Dr. Johnson who taught me the, especially the L of the tulip. Remember Dan Duncan, when I first met him many years ago on the freight dock, said, do you believe in election? I said, yes. I'd come to understand unconditional election. He said, what about limited atonement? I said, I don't know about that one. He said, well, you've got to get that one right. So Calvinism is uh, part of my theology because of Dan Duncan and S. Lewis Johnson and Believer's Chapel. And so that's part of our legacy. We share those traditions. And if you don't hold to Calvinism, those are the doctrines that are shaping the preaching of the word here at this a special outpost of the kingdom of Christ. Now, the five fundamentals of the faith, what are they? Maybe you could say them, maybe not. You've heard the word fundamentalist, which, by the way, is a word that's very confusing. Today, you hear about Islamic fundamentalist. Does that mean you're a Muslim if you're a fundamentalist? Uh, maybe you've heard about snake handlers called fundamentalists. Is, do you handle rattlesnakes to prove your faith? Is that what a fundamentalist is? Well, the word is morphed and shaped, and most people today say, I'm not sure if I can easily be called by this word because we don't know what it means. But the word actually originated at the Presbyterian General Assembly in 1910, interestingly. So here's what happened. There were some being ordained to the gospel ministry in the Presbyterian Church in New York State that no longer believed in certain key truths such as the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the inspiration of the Bible and Jesus' miracles. But they wanted to be ministers, and they were being approved by the presbytery. And that created an explosion. What did it mean to have unbelievers filling the pulpit? And that created then a reaction by saying, these are things we must make sure our ordinands those who are entering into ministry are in fact committed to. They become known as the inspiration of the Bible, the virgin birth of Christ, the substitutionary or vicarious atonement. As we talk about Isaiah 53 today, it's one of the great prophetic statements of the uh, substitutionary atonement. I can still hear Dr. Johnson say, the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. I heard him say that in class and in sermons multiple times. He hammered that home. Well, that was one of the issues of this great debate. Uh, the bodily resurrection of Christ and the reality of Jesus' miracles, including, if you will, his triumphant return in history. 
These were required and they became known as the five fundamentals of the faith as they engaged these liberal theologians that were hoping to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church. Now, to understand how this comes to a head, we need to go back a little bit more in history. So we're going to go back to what we might call the old Princeton tradition. Princeton Seminary was the place where Reformed theologians were shaped. Whether you were Presbyterian, Baptist, Independent, Brethren, whatever your tradition, if you wanted to have a profoundly biblical education that was shaped by the classic theology of the Reformation, Princeton was the bastion of that. And so knowing a little bit about its history is important. Some of the names, uh, we could pause and do a whole study of early teaching. Uh, Ashbel Green, Archibald Alexander, Samuel Miller. Some of you would know the name Charles Hodge because of his systematic theology. Uh, his son, Archibald Alexander Hodge. Some of you will know the name of B.B. Warfield, the greatest defender ever of biblical inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, he was there. Caspar Wistar Hodge, Gerhardus Voss, and Machen is in that tradition. He was a young professor there. So we're going to pass very quickly through the stories of these men. I'll just let you see their picture. A few comments about them. The leaders of the old Princeton tradition included these men. We could talk about each of them and give some of their uh, major points. But you've now seen their picture, a little bit of their history and their dates and some of their accomplishments. By the way, these slides, if you'd like to have them for your own study, they're public domain for you to have if you'd like. So we'll make sure you can get them. This person here is one that's very important. Uh, Dr. Johnson often said, you ought to read the entire set of B.B. Warfield's writings. They are the classic defense of historic Reformed theology. A teacher at Princeton from a Southern family, the greatest defender of the inerrancy of the Bible, and a man who cared for his wife for 40 years who was an invalid, a, a wonderfully compassionate example of Christian nurture in the family. Now, there are others that follow along in the tradition. This person may not be well known uh, in the uh, dispensational world, but on the equivalent of her hermeneutics of Scripture. If you think of uh, Schofield as kind of being the really popularizer of the dispensational hermeneutic, Gerhardus Voss is the great popularizer, if you will, of the Reformed covenantal hermeneutic. Now that may not sink in for everybody, but that's some theological tradition where there might be a parting of the ways on how we interpret the Bible. Is the Bible united? Or does it have a distinct track with two peoples of God? This is an intramural debate among Christians. But Voss would be that key leader in that tradition. Now, what we do need to understand, though, with that legacy of the old Princeton carrying on classic Reformation theology right up to the defense of the inerrancy of the Scripture in the late 1800s to the early 20th century, what happened that there would end up being students coming from seminary to come into the ministry that no longer believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection of Christ or the inerrancy of the Bible. What happened? How could the church no longer have believers? Well, something came along called the Enlightenment. Now, many of you have studied Enlightenment thinking. <clears throat> Enlightenment thinking was basically the philosophical rejection of Reformation theology for human reason in the historic European Christian context. The key leader of this is a philosopher, Immanuel Kant. If some of you have read Francis Schaeffer, you may remember how he used to talk about upper story knowledge and lower story knowledge. He would say, there's the world above the roof of the church. We can't see it, we don't, but we can know what's under the roof. That's basically Enlightenment philosophy. Transcendent theology of God, we know nothing. It's only a guess. It's a question mark. So we must claim our agnostic position about spiritual reality. But we can do this world things. We can do science and education. So we're going to look at ourselves and make sense of the world and just not be sure about God. 
Uh, that has been called the Kantian bifurcation of reality in his epistemology and metaphysics. Okay, isn't that a mouthful? Don't you like to say big words like that? Okay. He basically divided the world into two areas, one that's knowable and one that is not knowable. And that philosophical tradition, like the weight of gravity, will begin to go from philosophy and eventually into theology. And that is what will create liberal Protestant theology. Now, there's others that you should know about. The most important one that comes on the scene following Kant is a German Reformed philosopher by the name of Friedrich Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher became convinced that Kant was right, that we really can't believe in revelation from heaven. We can know nothing about God. We just believe he's there. But we have to live with this world, and the Christian tradition can't claim these truths. And so he created, if you will, the very heart of what all liberal theology believes. And that is what he called the absolute dependence of the soul upon God. In other words, we don't know who God is exactly. We can't really study him as some sort of theological direct knowledge. But in our hearts, we know he's there. We can't make sense of the world without God. So we just have a passionate, inward commitment to God that shapes everything we do. And therefore, theology is discretionary, personal. It's not important. As long as you have that commitment to the spark of divinity in your heart and that passion for God shapes everything you do, that, if you will, explains what liberal theology has been. Oh, we don't care whether you believe the Trinity or not, or the deity of Christ, or the resurrection. But are you committed to God's things in the world, his kingdom in the world, making the world a better place? Be passionate about changing the environment, about changing the school system, about making child labor laws better, about making sure that ships are safer on the sea, that transportation is more reachable for the masses, that the food is safe to eat, that the water is clean. That's depending on God and loving your neighbor. That's all that counts. That's the kingdom of God in the here and now. Do you believe in heaven or hell? Who knows? Is God loving? I guess. But do you love? Do you do it because you're dependent upon him? You see, theology goes out the window. This world becomes front and center. And the Christian legacy is all about the here and now and making a difference in the world. And that's all that matters. And if you look at any liberal theologian, it's this passionate commitment to do something here and now because you just believe there's something up there and it's that stirring of your emotions. So if you will, liberal theology went from the mind and heart to only the emotions. Your passionate commitment worked out in this world. Schleiermacher gave us the first articulation of that and it will begin to run through other names like Albrecht Ritschel, who taught, says the kingdom of God is moral progress. It's the evolution of society. That's the kingdom of God. Uh, you'll have another man by the name of uh, Wilhelm Hermann. You know, he kind of looks like a young Dr. Ryrie with a beard to me. I don't know if you know Dr. Ryrie, but a little bit of reminder of that young, passionate, thin face. But the bottom line is that this man will have influence for our seminarians. You know, he trained two students, one named Karl Barth and another named Rudolf Bultmann. But you may not know that he had another student by the name of J. Gresham Machen. Machen studied under him. And Machen, when he was a student from Princeton, he went to Europe to study at Marburg. Remember, Marburg is the great city where, going back to the Reformation, where Zwingli and Luther came together and couldn't agree on the Lord's Supper. That's a, I, I'm tempted to be a Reformation historian now. I've got to stop, come back to our age. But this is where he taught, and Machen was so struck by the passionate, spiritual commitment to this world and to his knowledge that he said, I think... Hermann might be right. He said, all that theology, I want to have a passion about the world, a love for these things, and the scholarship to know like this man. And he was swept away. 
And there are a series of letters that show that as he studied under Hermann, he nearly said, I'm ready to abandon all of my legacy of Orthodox Reformed theology. History was turning. We wouldn't be here today the way we're here today if Machen says, if it weren't for my mother's prayers that kept me grounded in the truths of Scripture. Okay, so it's kind of an amazing story when you think about who trained under this man. Uh, Bart is called the father of neo-orthodoxy. It's not orthodoxy at all, but it's a kinder and gentler liberalism, whereas Bultmann had what he called the demythologizing of Scripture, where he had to say, we've got to get rid of God and all the Bible and stop pretending that we believe any of that stuff. We don't. That's all mythology. We just need to make sense of the world on our own and appreciate the legacy we have from all the wonder of Christianity in the past that's not true. That's Boltmanianism. Okay? So this will take different forms. Again, if we had time, we'd talk about Ernst Trelcht, Adolf von Harnack. Harnack is famous for saying, the way Christianity will best develop is through the great ecumenical movement in the world where we stop believing any theology and we just start working together in unity. Lutheran, stop fighting over consubstantiation. Reformed, stop fighting over predestination. Baptist, stop fighting about total immersion. You brethren, stop fighting about the way you have the Lord's Supper. Just get on with life. Stop worrying about doctrine. And let's all get together and be one. And Walter Rauschenbusch is our American equivalent where he created what we often call today the social gospel. Liberalism in America has often been called the social gospel. The good news of the kingdom of God is we're making the world better. We're cleaning up the beaches of pollution. The kingdom of God has come. Okay. Now, I'm not attacking any of the good things that people do. But is that the gospel? It was called Christianity in Machen's day. So we get the word fundamentalist that comes on the scene. And again, this would be a nice course in its own right. You remember in 1910, this issue with the Presbytery New York sparked, if you will, five things that needed to be defended. And in the process, there was a recognition that liberal theology was beginning to permeate seminaries in Europe and America. And the church, if they believed historic Christianity, needed to do something about it. And as a result, there was a man by the name of Lyman Stewart who had a tremendous success in the oil business in California, and he used his great resources to help bring together theologians that produced a series of books from 1910 to 1915 that were called The Fundamentals of the Faith. And it's really from these books that the word fundamentalist is born. What happens in these books is that they are produced over five years, and with Lyman Stewart's resources, they were sent to every English-speaking minister in the world. Talk about a splash. Every minister who could speak English got these books. What in the world are they talking about? Some would say, wow, we, we've got to really stand strong. I said, Man, this is some kind of radical right-wing conservative conspiracy to take away intellectual freedom and free speech and the advance of our knowledge. And it hit like a nuclear bomb, if you will. No one could miss the story. And those that favored that particular uh, movement became known with a pejorative word of opprobrium, fundamentalist. They were despised fundamentalists, those wacky, unthinking, conservative Bible thumpers. So the liberals looked at them because it attacked higher criticism, because uh, it needed to have a different view of the Bible than inspiration. And so the fundamentalists explained why higher criticism was not consistent with the Bible in light of inspiration, why we needed to affirm the deity of Christ what sin and salvation really was, why evolution, as it was taught, was atheistic and denied the creative work of God. And it had to reassert why evangelism and missions are important. You see, if you become liberal in your theology, evangelism is no longer saying, do you know that you're a sinner, that you have a 
need of a Savior who died for your sin, who rose again from the dead to grant you his life, who offers you an eternal destiny to be spared from the wrath of God and judgment and eternity apart from him under the holy wrath of God in hell, to we've come to educate your children and build you a hospital. Believe whatever you want. See, historic Christianity came to educate children and build a hospital, but tell you about the saving work of Jesus. Evangelism and missions were radically changing in light of this world emphasis. So, what led to the fundamentalist crisis controversy? Well, obviously the Enlightenment as it impacted biblical studies through higher criticism, theological liberalism, Darwinian evolution, and then responded to by this extraordinary global English witness of multiple theologians from many traditions who believed in historic Christianity called the Fundamentals of the Faith. And into that context, in 1923, a young Princetonian professor who had wrestled with, if you will, Hermannian liberalism as we spoke, who came back and said, I believe the Bible. He had the courage to write a book called Christianity and Liberalism. He was the first person who was willing to call, as the saying goes, a spade a spade. He said, you hear all these Christian teachers, pastors in all these churches, they're Christian ministers. And he looked at what liberalism, theological liberalism was teaching and historic Christianity and what he taught it. And he said, they're using the very same words, but they believe diametrically two different things. We need to recognize that there's a counterfeit Christianity and the authentic Christianity. And it's time that we call the counterfeit Christianity what it is. Liberalism is not Christianity. It is a different religion entirely. It is naturalistic, materialistic, agnostic philosophy cloaked in the language of historic Christianity. And so what did it look like? Of course I believe in the resurrection. Every time someone's home is cleaned up and they have food, Christ is raised to life in their home. Of course I believe in sin. Sin is the lack of education and culture. Of course I believe in the cross. All of us should follow our commitment, whatever it costs, and our sacrifice to achieve our goals. Of course I believe in the Bible. It is an inspiring source of encouragement for whatever you believe. They're using all the great words, but redefining every one of them. And there was a daring young professor who had nearly been swept away in the power of the liberal ideology who came back to his roots and said, you know what, I gotta tell the world what's going on. He had the courage to step forward and say, if you're a liberal, you are not a Christian. Wow, those are fighting words. That's what made fundamentalism such a hated thing. Not only their ideas, but they pulled the sheep's wool off of the wolf of unbelief and said, that is not a Christian. He said, if you're going to be a Christian, here's what the Bible teaches. and You need to stand either with the Bible or not. Either you're a believer or not. Stop pretending you are when you're not. Be honest enough to be what you are. <clears throat> it's interesting that Machen really had a high appreciation for Unitarians. So what? He said, the one thing about a Unitarian is that they're honest. They don't believe in the deity of Christ, and they'll tell you right up front. They don't believe in the Trinity, and they'll tell you that right up front. They don't believe in human sinfulness, and they'll tell you that right up front. They don't believe that the Bible's the inspired word. They'll tell you, said, all I'm asking for is honesty. Stop calling yourself a Christian when you're not. Leave the church because you don't believe what the church's creeds and doctrines hold to. Identify yourself for who you are. Well, that would have been the honorable thing to do, but guess what? The liberals were not honorable, in Machen's mind at least said, we own the governments of the church, we own the buildings of the church, we own the purse strings of the church, we own the seminaries of the church, 
and we're going to stay in and <clears throat> we're going to kick you out for being a troublemaker and denying our freedom. That's kind of like Machen's story. He told the truth and he was set free. Okay. Set free from his denomination. And it all comes to a head at the Auburn Affirmation. In Auburn, New York, uh, <clears throat> in 1923 24, a group of Presbyterian ministers came together and they basically said, We should not be bound by that General Assembly thing in 1910 saying you need to hold to these five principles. We believe in academic liberty. Christianity is much broader. We can. We should be free to decide what we believe. And so the Auburn Affirmation ended up by being signed by nearly, I think some 2,000 Presbyterian ministers signed it, claiming it was just assuring the freedom of intellectual inquiry in the church. But basically what it said is, you no longer have to worry about what your minister believes when he gets into the pulpit. Whatever he believes is up to each church and each conscience. So the Auburn Affirmation is what is in the context, and that brings us really to the extraordinary work of J. Gressa Machen, who will become the forefront of this work. Now, a little bit about why did Machen leave Princeton? Here he was, the most prestigious school of Christian orthodoxy in the world. One of the greatest endowments for any seminary in the world. A legacy unbroken back to Calvin by way of their founders through Turretin right to Geneva with the great Calvinistic theology. Why would he leave? Well, there was what was called the reorganization of Princeton Seminary. In 1928 and 29, the General Assembly said, we need to require every denominational seminary to have a board of directors that represents the full breadth of theology of our church. So sure, we want Orthodox people at Princeton, it's always been an Orthodox seminary, but we need to have some Schleiermachians and liberals of different kinds, because that's part of our church and you're under our oversight. And we now believe in the Auburn Affirmation. When Machen realized that the board of the great bulwark of Reformed Orthodoxy was going to have leadership that did not believe in historic Christianity, he said, it's over. It's only going to take a few years until the professors our students have here no longer are believing Christians. The gospel will not be taught. The Bible will not be the authority of the curriculum. We just need to start a new seminary because all is lost. Now, he was really viewed as a radical because he was calling in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, the difference between Christian and liberal, two different religions. Now he's breaking. He's viewed like, well, are you some kind of stupid radical? You're breaking from the greatest seminary in the world. Why would you do that? Because he said the gospel will not be taught here in a few generations. I want to be very careful not to criticize the brilliance of Princeton Seminary but you can pray to any God you want at Princeton today, including plants, if that's the way you're best attuned to God. And the Bible is not its authority. Machen saw all that a hundred years ago. And so he chose the most auspicious year in economic history to start a new seminary. Does anybody know what happened in 1929? It's amazing that the seminaries here, it was a miracle of God. It's basically funded by Machen himself. He came from a Southern family, father of Baltimore attorney, and he brought all of his Princetonians and professors that came with him, and he paid their salary and their tuition for the first 20 years by his estate. He had died in 1937 on New Year's Day. So a great story of a leader, but is his book Christianity and Liberalism that we, I'm not gonna go through his timeline here because the time is an issue tells a little bit about his history. He was a young scholar. He served with the YMCA in World War I as a non-combatant. He was a Princeton professor. He started Westminster Seminary. And of course, starting a seminary, we'll pause here, was not a radical thing for Presbyterian ministers. Those of us in the Reformed tradition, regardless of stripe, we take the Great Commission very serious, go and make learners of the gospel. So we start schools everywhere we go. 
That's what Reformed Christians do. We're going to have a seminary, we're going to have a college, we're going to have a university, we're going to have a uh, Christian school, we're going to have a Christian preschool, we're going to have a Sunday school, we're going to have a publishing press, we're going to have educated congregants with educated clergy. It's what we do. So Machen started the school and they said, oh, that we can't do anything about it. But why did a new church come along? Because he was daring enough in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, to say, you know what, we not only need to deal with seminaries, but we need to deal with pastors in the pulpit, elders in the session or uh, elder board, as well as new members, and make sure that Christianity is being upheld at every point. In fact, we need to remember we're sending out missionaries, and what if we're only sending out missionaries to do good things, but they never talk about the saving work of Christ? They've missed the main point. All these other things are wonderful, but they flow from the gospel, not in place of the gospel. So he said, we need to have an independent board of foreign missions to make sure that the missionaries that we support believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not liberals. They are Christians that know the gospel and do all the good work that missionaries always do. Hospitals and schools and shaping families. And that got him in trouble. You know why? because he started messing around with a major financial supply for the denomination. And they told him, you need to shut down your mission board now. And he said, I can't, this is biblical, I must. And so without being allowed to defend himself all the way from presbytery to general assembly, he was simply dismissed. It's one of the great examples of non-free speech in a uh, Context. Could you imagine going to court and you're not allowed to present your case? How would you like to go to court right now and the judge says, we're not going to let you present your case? Well, I'm appealing. You get appealed. And you pre we're not letting you present your case. You get to the final Supreme Court. We're not going to let you present. You're done. That's what happened. He was railroaded out because they could not answer his charges. The truth was so gapingly evident by one who was articulate to present it, they didn't want to take him on and they just stitched him up, silenced him and kicked him out. So he was forced to start a new church. Uh, it became known the Presbyterian Church of America. They lost in court. They took the name the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. That's what it's known to today. The PCA does exist. It came out of the Southern Presbyterian Church and people have often asked, well, how did the PCA be able to keep its name when the Northern one lost it? They didn't call themselves the Presbyterian Church of America, but the Presbyterian Church in America. That's where I have my credentials. And the answer is, apparently, they had better lawyers. <laughs> they were able to fight for their name, and they kept it. So, at any rate, so he ended up starting a new church. And just as the new church starts, he dies of pneumonia on a preaching mission up to Bismarck, North Dakota on New Year's Day. He worked himself to death and he died. So his gravestone is in Baltimore and his famous last words uh, are a telegraph he wrote to John Murray, one of the great reformed theologians whose works are still in print. Uh, he said, the active obedience of Christ, there's no hope without it. What he was saying is, I have so much to do and I never can get it all done, but I thank God that Jesus has kept all the law for me. That's my hope. Those were his last words in a telegram to John Murray. Uh, his uh, grave in Baltimore in Greek, he taught Greek, his Greek New Testament uh, class uh, book is still in print along with his other book for over 100 years. And his words say in Greek, faithful unto death. So. Some of the other liberal names that maybe if you're church historians, you might remember the names such as Charles Briggs, Henry Preserve Smith, Henry Sloan Coffin, Harry Emerson Fosdick. They made lots of attention, whereas Machen was driven. Harry Emerson Fosdick is famous for his sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And he was one of those that just railed against having theology as part of the preaching. There's so much more we could say about this. But here's some of the conservatives then. Uh, these are the men that came together that helped to form uh, the Westminster Seminary Movement. 
And while uh, Lewis Berry Chafer was not a Princetonian, he was in regular dialogue and did ministry together with Machen in the attempt to bring about a conservative movement. There's, again, every one of these guys, there's a story. So here's the Auburn affirmation. There's much more we could say about it. My time is waning. But you see, I, I said 2,000, it was over 1,200. Presbyterian ministers signed it. And at the end of the day, the Auburn Affirmation rejected the necessity of all five of these fundamentals of the faith. And this is a classic cartoon that basically shows what's called the descent of the modernists. You see, there's a, a church member at the top, there's a minister in the middle, and there's a professor at the bottom. And they're all going downhill. And the professor is just a step away from atheism. That's what liberal theology does. The minister, he's following this tracks, and he's at the point of saying, I'm not sure about the deity of Christ. I'm not sure about this atonement of the blood sacrifice for salvation. And then there's the hapless church member. There's up at the top, starting to follow his leaders. And it begins by saying, I'm not sure the Bible's reliable. Uh, can I really believe uh, in miracles? This, if you will, modern liberalism is a descent into unbelief, and it is the suicide of the church. Liberalism is the beginning of killing the church at its very core. I like to use the illustration. Imagine you're in the space shuttle, you're in the NASA program, and you're up there every day, and you have the joy of getting out and doing repairs every once in a while, free floating in space. You get to see things no one can ever see from that perspective. But you have this thing called a tether. You finally say, this tether is really bothering me. It's getting in the way. I think I'm just going to be liberal, free from my spacecraft. I'm just going to cut myself loose so I can find my way. Guess what? You find your way into oblivion. Not immediately. I mean, you still have oxygen in your tank. You still have some... But... Finally, you just float away and you die. I want you to be clear, as a seminary president, I love liberality. When I pass the offering plate, I like people to be free to put a lot in. But as a seminary president, I oppose liberalism because it's saying we are cutting ourselves off from historic Christianity and the authority of Scripture. And today, the story of liberalism and Christianity go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. It's how you answer the question, did God really say? How you answer that question determines whether you're a liberal or whether you're an authentic Christian. So now, notice here, I go through the book and I summarize point by point what Machen says I have an article I've written on. If you'd like to get the article, I can send you a copy of that too, if it would be useful, or you go through. But at the core, as I summarize and conclude, the bottom line is Machen said liberalism is naturalistic materialism cloaked in Christianity. Historic Christianity believes in the supernatural revelation of God and the real saving work of Jesus Christ. It really is the difference between believing in the supernatural worldview or believing just in a materialistic worldview. And tragically, when you go to many churches today, liberalism is being cloaked again with Christian words. Our calling is to say, yes, God has said. Machen loves the phrase stupendous. The word stupendous means amazingly amazing. Not just amazing, amazingly amazing. And he says, Christianity believes in stupendous supernaturalism. Not the death, dying, false spirituality of materialistic ideology cloaked with Christian words. Well, that's my lecture today. Let's conclude in prayer. Lord, thank you for the joy and privilege and challenge to study a difficult point in history. We thank you for the legacy that spiritual leaders of all traditions have had to stand in the authority of Scripture. Whether we would call ourselves fundamentalists or not, 
whether that word means anything today or not. We are grateful, Lord, that we can claim to be biblical Christians that follow the legacy. They go back to Jesus and the disciples. It was shaped by the reformers, bequeathed to us by Bible scholars and teachers who loved you and believed your word. Lord, may we be faithful in that tradition to pass it on to others. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. No time for questions. Saved by the bell. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's great. Glad to do it. I was going to, if you looked at me at uh, quarter, a, quarter after, I was going to